As a musician and content creator, I've spent a lot of time trying to get my head where my students are at, trying to understand how they feel, what they're thinking, what are their limitations, uh, how can I help them better? What gray areas exist for them that if they could just break through those, uh, they would see a transformation in their jazz playing. So I'm always trying to do, I've thought about this for many years. And years ago, I made a book based around this idea of how to get someone who really is starting from scratch or maybe someone who's a little bit newer to jazz or maybe just in the middle of their journey, how do they start from the ground up and build up those jazz improvisation skills so that they understand everything. So in today's episode, I want to go over that, my music theory checklist for understanding jazz improvisation. Here we go. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. All right, what's up, everybody? Brent here from LearnJazzStandards.com, which, of course, is a blog, a podcast, and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. And as always, I'm super thankful for you being here. I appreciate it. I definitely don't take it for granted. You're at the gym right now, sweating, and you have other options of things to listen to. You're on your commute to work right now, and you could be listening to NPR. I don't know. You, uh, you know, you, you, you are on the train right now now and you're listening to this and I really thank you and appreciate this uh, for for listening, hanging out with me today. And as always, my goal is just to give you some value, just to uh, help you in some big or small way with your jazz playing so you can learn something this week and apply it, think about it, whatever it may be. Like I said, today's episode is a music theory checklist for understanding jazz improvisation. And this is important uh, because... I believe there are some fundamental things that you need to understand about music and jazz harmony to truly understand how to become a great jazz improviser. And yes, as you've heard me, heard me preach over and over and over again on this podcast, if you don't have the listening to jazz side down, if you aren't learning, you know, stuff by ear, learning jazz language, you know, forget about anything I'm about to talk about because those are the main things, you know, hearing the music. It's an aural language, understanding it that way. But also the music theory is really important and understanding how it works is hugely important. And bear with me for a second. Let me give you a little bit of a back story here to how I've come up with this because I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, years and years ago, I came out with my first course called 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing, and many of you know it now as 30 Steps to Better Jazz Playing. And that is really my premier course to this day, the most important course I have Um and you know it's my it's my really comprehensive practicing course. Um, however, when I first launched that course, I think it was four years ago now, three four years ago, well, lose track. Uh, I noticed that there were some gaps in some students' knowledge. I noticed that there were some students that were being left behind a little bit because they just didn't understand some fundamentals, or they just they missed a part somewhere along the line. And so I really started thinking really hard about well, as far as music theory goes, or as far as understanding jazz harmony, where would I start? If I was trying to like bring someone through the very beginning and bring them through a process to really understanding all this stuff, where would I start? And that's where I really started thinking about uh, creating my book, Zero to Improv, which I know a number of you also have as well. And that book is really all about more of the music theory side of things, starting from the beginning, building from the ground up, how to understand jazz improvisation, how to become a better jazz improviser. So this is really my 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 goal of this book is just really to help those who are either at the beginning of their journey or maybe they're intermediates. Any gap that's missing, I just wanted to give a from the ground up sort of comprehensive, you know, what you actually need to know and how to apply it sort of a deal. So that's that's what that uh, was all about. And, you know, uh, I actually came out yesterday with my companion course for this, which really helps people get through the book. And last year, I came out with a companion course for my other book, The Jazz Standards Playbook. And I really saw that that was really helping people because the books are really great. There's lots of great knowledge in them. But if you don't apply them or you don't have support for them, if you don't uh, get through them, then that's, you know, that's missing part of the point, right, of, of a book, of, of music book. So I found that the companion course was working really well. I wanted to make a companion course for Zero to Improv to help the students further. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, if you're on my newsletter, you know that that launched yesterday. And if uh, you are interested in checking that out, you can go to Zero to Improv dot com and uh, check that out 
uh, there. Join the rest of us all in there. Uh, but that's what that's going to be about today is not necessarily the book, but the, the stuff that I talk about in the book. And so that you can go through this checklist with me just to be like, hey, yes, I've got that. No, I don't got that. Yes, I have that or need to work a little bit more on this or hmm, don't completely understand all that all of this right here. Right. So that's what this checklist is all about. So let's go over it right now. More of a talking episode today. So take out your notes and let's get started. All right, so I have something called the Jazz Improv Rule that I talk about, and the Jazz Improv Rule simply states that in order to become a better jazz improviser, you need to understand jazz harmony. You need to understand jazz harmony, and that's where more of the intellectual side comes in for me, uh, as opposed to the ear side, is getting this music theory in there that we need to understand harmony. So where do we start? What's the very first place uh, we need to uh, address to understand to have some basics in place? So checklist item number one is scales. Checklist item number one is scales. Now, we learn scales not necessarily because it's going to help us improvise, Uh, But because we know scales to help us learn our instrument better, we learn scales so that we can learn how to apply them in a conceptual way over chords later on down the road, and we learn scales to understand what I call pitch collections options in front of you. So number one is scales. Now under scales, what do you need to know? Uh, The first item would be basic, what I call basic scales. And your basic scales is like your major scale, okay? All three minor scales, which is your natural minor, harmonic minor, and melodic minor scale. And then I also throw in the diminished scale. The diminished scale is also important to me. So that's what I would call your basic scales. You need to know those because they're just essential basics of understanding your instrument, navigating it, which is hugely important for becoming an improviser is navigating your instrument well and simply understanding it and understanding how to construct those. If we understand how to construct scales, we can start learning how to understand how to construct chords, chord progressions, for the, so on and so forth, all right? Um, the next kinds of scales that I think are really important to know are the modes, the major modes. Um, there are other modes, like the modes of the melodic minor, and those, of course, can be helpful to geek out on, but I think that the major modes are important, and that would be uh, Ionian, Dorian, uh, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, uh, Locrian, right? Those are the modes I'm talking about of of the major scale. And those are important to know as far as jazz harmony goes because we really use the modes a lot to think about jazz harmony. For example, the most classic example I could possibly think is modal harmony, like uh, Miles Davis's So What, right? A lot of us know that song with the bass line, right? That's a classic one of a kind of blue. Uh, when we think about that, the D minor chord there, we're not thinking about natural minor, we're thinking about Dorian. And lots of times, uh, jazz musicians are thinking Dorian over minor chords, not necessarily thinking about playing a scale over it, but those are the sounds that they're hearing rather than a, a natural minor scale, right? So the modes are important. The modes are really important for um, starting to add pitch collections to harmonic elements of jazz and chord progressions, all right? So the modes are important. And then finally, what I think is important with scales is uh, basic patterns, applying patterns. And we talked about that actually in uh, our last episode, episode 151, Applying Patterns to Scales for Jazz Improv Flexibility. So go ahead, check that one out later. I believe that's important because um, we are furthering that idea of understanding your instrument, gaining that flexibility. So you might learn how to play these scales. These are just notes that are in order. We need to know how to play them forwards, backwards, sideways, however, right? So that we have flexibility on our instrument so that we truly do understand these scales. And that's where I think applying patterns to scales is really important. All right. So checklist item number one is scales and that's basic scales. That's the modes of the major scale. And that is applying patterns to them. And uh, yeah, in zero to improv, I do talk about other scales that, you know, other things, but those are really what I would consider the checklist of like, Hey, as far as scales go, 
Make sure you know those. These are important for understanding your instrument. These are important for having a little bit of a foundation to work with when we move on to further steps down the checklist, all right? So number one is scales. I think this is important uh, for understanding, ultimately understanding uh, jazz theory, jazz harmony, right? Okay, checklist item number two is chords. Checklist item number two is chords. So we're just kind of going from scales and we're just like kind of adding another building block on top of that, right? And that is chords. Now, as far as chords go, what do we need to know? And I want you to be thinking right now, do I know all of these? Do I know all of these chords? Do I understand to construct them? The first is triads, okay? And there's a lot of jazz musicians that kind of forget about triads for some reason, right? We don't want to forget about triads. Triads are hugely important to think about even before seventh chords. So triads, make sure you know the basic kinds of triads. So that would be your major triad, your minor triad, your augmented triad, and your diminished triad, understanding those basics. But I go further than that, and it's not um, it's not good enough, and piano players know this, this is obvious to piano players, but it's not good enough just to know how to play those in root position, to understand the formulas. Like, for example, to understand that a diminished triad is root, flat, three, flat, five, that's good. It's not good enough, though. We need to know the different inversions of those. And when I say inversions, I mean, okay, maybe we start the chord on the flat three. So now it's flat three, flat five, root, right? You need to know how to play those chords forwards, backwards, and sideways. And for the guitar players, I'm not even talking about how to play drop two or, or even piano player. I'm not even... Uh, this is for everybody. This isn't just for... Um, chordal instruments, and you don't even have to go that far. This is for saxophone, bass, trumpet, whatever your instrument is, fill in the blanks. You need to understand these chords, and you need to understand how to play them starting on different tones of those chords, right? Um, so triads and their inversions, make sure that you know how to do that. Uh, then we go, of course, to seventh chords, and there are five different basic kinds of seventh chords, and those are, of course, the major seventh chord, the minor seventh chord, the dominant seventh chord, the half diminished or the minor seven flat five chord, and the fully diminished seventh chord, right? Okay, so there's five of those basic seventh chords. I mean, if you don't know these seventh chords, right, and how to construct them, and like I said, also how to play the inversions of those so that you can start that chord on any chord tone. I mean, this is hugely important. This is where it really starts going into the improv side of things for me. Uh, is not necessarily when we start at scales at all. It's when we go to chords and chord tones. Um, because if you land on, on a chord and you land on the flat seven, all right, and you need to know, okay, we're on a minor seventh chord now, flat seven. All right, what are the other notes and where do we go from here? You have to have this all mapped out. It's all about mapping, mapping out your instrument, mapping out the chords, mapping out the chord progressions, right? So understanding these seventh chords and the inversions, all right? This is important. Now, I go and do a bunch of exercises personally over these sorts of things. Um, I do chord tone exercises where, for example, and, and this is something that I want you to do too, you might be working on minor seventh chords, okay? Minor seventh chords. What you can start doing is doing exercises where you put, you, you take random um, seventh chords and string them together. So you might start root position going up one. So maybe let's say it's a C minor. And then you go down a C sharp minor seventh chord, okay? Down a C sharp uh, minor seventh chord but you start on the nearest note. So maybe it's not gonna be the root. Maybe you're gonna start on the flat three. Maybe the nearest note is the flat three of the C sharp minor seventh, and you're gonna walk down that one. And then you might do the C minor seventh again. And then so you're gonna walk up that one and walk down, walk up, walk down, connecting it with voice leading to the nearest chord tone. <clears throat> so exercises like that are important because then you're really understanding chords. You're not understanding them by themselves, but you're starting to think about them in terms of chord progressions. Um, so there's lots of exercises around, of course, all of these different checklist items that you can start applying to really understand them better. Because, of course, right now I'm talking about the what, like what do you need to know, but the how or the application of those is, of course, another level, all right? Now, the last thing I want to say about chords that I think you need to know is just basic alterations and extensions. And so this is important for jazz, especially because jazz musicians really utilize 
uh, extensions and alterations. So jazz musicians uh, will play uh, the uh, C minor 11th rather than a C minor 7th. Jazz musicians will play uh, an altered seventh chord for the five chord, which means it's got a flat 13 in it, which means it's got a sharp nine, you know, and if all that you're not understanding right now, if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, Brent, well, this is definitely something to look at on your checklist. Oh, I need to understand what this means. I need to understand this because you're going to see this come up in jazz time and time again. So if you understand alterations and extensions and which ones you're supposed to play on different chords, which ones do not work on certain kinds of chords, for example, um, you're not going to play a flat 13 on a minor seventh chord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, at least that's just, you know, that doesn't, that's not a common alteration to an extension on a minor seventh chord. You just need to know these sorts of things. Um, so alterations and extensions, that's a basic thing you need to understand as well. So checklist item number two was chords. So understand the basic triads and their inversions, understand the basic seventh chords and their inversions, and understand the alterations and extensions that you can apply on different qualities of seventh chords, all right? So checklist item number two for the music theory checklist for understanding jazz improvisation. All right, checklist item number three. This is where we start tying together number one and number two together. Scales and their relationship with chords. Understanding scales and their relationship with chords is checklist item number three. Now, this is where you have to be a little bit careful, and I have talked a lot about on this podcast, well, on Learn Jazz Standards in general, our videos, our blog posts, that scales need to be careful when we're thinking about them to be used for improvisation because in the wrong hands, scales can just sound like scales, and no one wants to be, everybody can tell when you hear a jazz solo and it sounds like people are just playing scales or that that's where they're coming from, Right. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to think, like I said before, as scales, as pitch collections. So this is one of those checklist items that while it can be used for, I mean, well, how do we say it? It can be used for evil. Uh, it could also be used for good, too. And so we want to understand what scales apply over different kinds of chords and what options we can have, because that can help us think about it differently. It's like a different perspective. Like, you know, it's like that whole thing where you have someone in the room and they're looking at a triangle or a shape in the middle of the room. And what do they actually see? Right. Like one person sees this, the other person sees this. That's kind of like being able to apply different scales over different kind of chords. It gives you a different angle to understand your note choices. Hope I made myself clear there. So, this is where especially knowing the modes of the major scale can come in handy to understand that over a dominant seventh chord, the mixolydian scale or the mode, that's the fifth mode of the major scale, is, uh, is a, a pitch collection that is very valuable, that makes a lot of sense to that chord. It is made for that chord, essentially, right? To understand there is a relationship between the different uh, degrees of, of chords within the diatonic series uh, in relationship to scales. And so as you can already see, in order to understand anything I'm talking about, you already have to understand scales and you already have to understand chords. So checklist item number three, scales in the relationship with chords is not understandable unless you already understand scales and chords. That's why we're now combining them together to understand them. So I don't think that you need to know all the chord scale theory in the world. I really don't. I think some people go crazy with this stuff. And honestly, uh, it, I, it, it makes me lose my mind sometimes when I see people obsessing over this stuff. But I do think that you need to have a, a basic understanding of some chord scale theory just to understand what things are available to you. For example, if you see a minor major seventh chord, like the first chord of Solar, then a great scale to think about is the melodic minor scale, or at least that's one option, right? You can think of chord tones too. You can think about a lot of different things, but that's one thing that you can think about. So I think having some of those basic understandings of chord scale theory is really important. That is checklist item number three. Okay, checklist item number four is chord progressions. Understanding chord progressions. Now there's uh, three different components to this that I've written down. So take notes, pay attention here. The first thing you need to understand about chord progressions is of course, how to build them. Like you need to understand uh, the major diatonic series. Now, what is that? If you're like, what's the major di diatonic series? I don't understand this at all. This is where we come up with two, five, one chord progressions, all these Roman numerals 
one six two five one three six two five one one four three six. All these numbers. That's what I'm talking about when I mean the diatonic series. So we need to understand if we're in the key of concert C major that the one chord, if we're harmonizing uh, minor seventh chords or sorry, uh, just seventh chords in general, we need to understand that the one chord is a major seventh chord. So C major seven. The two chord is a minor seven. D minor seven. The three chord is. E minor seven. Four chord is F major seven. The five chord is G seven. The uh, the sixth chord is A minor seven. The seventh chord is B minor seven flat five, half diminished, right? And of course, the one chord is major seven. Like we have to understand that, right? And then of course, that's just major harmony. We need to understand minor harmony, which is uh, way more complicated. And this is where it could drive you nuts. Um, but minor harmony is difficult to understand, but luck, you're in luck. We have a whole entire podcast episode where I had uh, a professor of mine come on, and, and uh, an old professor of mine, of course, when I was in college, come on and talk about this. So that was episode um, 114. So if you just go to learnjazzstandards.com forward slash episode 114, I talk about minor harmony with uh, my old professor, Dan Carrillo, and he really does an excellent job of understanding that. But we need to understand how to build chord progressions through major harmony and minor harmony. The next thing we need to understand is important jazz chord progressions, you know, what they actually are. And a lot of this comes with just learning jazz standards, obviously, but I do think that the point of my Zero to Improv book and the point of this checklist right now is to break things down further and just be like, well, what are you actually seeing? And so when you see a two, five, one chord progression, you need to know that a two, five, one chord progression is the most important uh, chord progression in in jazz, uh, whether it's major or a minor two five one. Those are going to come up time and time and time and time again. And if you know how, uh, if you know how to play a two five one in any key, you're in good hands already. And if you understand how to navigate that in an improvisation setting, well, I mean, you've pretty much got a big chunk of jazz figured out right there, as far as improvisation goes all right so there's of course like a one six two five one chord progression you just need to know what those important jazz progressions are um and then i also think it's important to know some general substitutions that you see in jazz because jazz musicians make harmony even more complicated by adding substitutions to certain chords that you just need to be aware of so for example one of those would be like a tritone substitution what is a tritone substitution right you have to understand that i talk about that by the way in episode 96 if you want to go check that out later that's just one example um, actually, it's not just tritone substitution. I think in episode 96, I talk about five main ones, which are the same ones I talk about in Zero to Improv that you can check out. So episode 96 is a good place for that. So number four is chord progressions. You need to know how to build them. You need to know the important jazz chord progressions. You need to know the common substitutions, right? So again, like if we're looking back at our checklist so far, everything's building off each other. We start with scales. We start with, then we go to chords. Then we go to combining scales and chords together and understanding how they work together. And then we go to chord progressions, right? Because what makes up chord progressions? Chords do, right? So you see how everything's coming full circle. We're just building, building, building from the ground up here. Okay, number five. We're, we're, we only have two more left here, by the way. So um, checklist item number five is jazz standards. And I, when I say jazz standards, I'm thinking more about the theory side of things. I'm not thinking about, um, I'm thinking about the theory side more so than I am of, you know, learning them per se, more like understanding them and knowing what. So the first thing about jazz standards is of course, what tunes should you know, right? And I have my, is it famous? I don't know, 50 jazz standards you need to know list that if you type in jazz standards on Google, it's going to come up. Um, so I, and I have a lot of videos and podcast episodes about what jazz standards you need to know. But of course, you need to first start with the what, what jazz standards are important, which ones have uh, a lot of lessons. Of course, in my other books, I, I really talk about that. But you know, jazz standards, which ones you need to know. And then, of course, important song forms. And that's more where the theory side comes in, knowing what important song forms exist in jazz. So the blues, uh, we've been talking that, about that lately on this podcast. The blues is an important song form in jazz. So you need to know all the different ways that jazz musicians play the blues, right? So there are, there are multiple different uh, jazz blues chord progressions, and you need to know the like a basic blues chord progression, just the one, four, five. You need to know all that stuff. That's important to jazz. That's really a lot of, uh, you know, jazz is African-American music, and that's a lot where this stuff is coming from, right? I mean, you understand the blues, jazz, all that stuff. 
And then, of course, there's rhythm changes. Rhythm changes is bebop in the 1940s. You have to understand that because that is a really important form in jazz. So understanding important song forms is important. That's number five. And again, let's look back on this for a second. Checklist item number four was chord progressions. So if we understand chord progressions, then we can understand tunes, right? We can understand jazz standards. So you see how this is a really like, you know, from the ground up sort of a thing here. Scales, chords, scales and chords, chord progressions, now standards and common song forms, right? So that's checklist item number five is jazz standards, understanding them in general. Okay, now the last one that I think as far as music theory goes, understanding jazz harmony, uh, number six, checklist item number six is conceptualizing jazz language, okay? Conceptualizing jazz language. Now, when I talk about jazz language, obviously, I always talk about learning solos by ear. I always talk about learning licks by ear, taking them into all 12 keys. Of course, just listening to jazz. I mean, it's an aural form of music. I talk about in episode 115, how we need to have a balance, how we need to have a diversity of you know, learning stuff by ear, but we also need to have the theory side, like what we're talking about today. So that's episode 115, if you want to hear me rant more. Um, but this is really where we start conceptualizing jazz language. We talk about enclosures, like enclosures is a bebop way of understanding how to navigate chord changes. Um, I think we recently talked about that in episode 150, uh, 100, 150, sorry, episode 150, using enclosures to create bebop lines over a jazz blues. And of course, there's guide tones, right? Understanding those important notes in each chord and how to voice lead them. That would be the thirds and sevenths. So if you have a two, five, one, learning how to play the guide tones, but voice lead them together. There's different ways we can conceptualize jazz language and how to play quote unquote right notes or quote unquote strong notes in chords and chord progressions to really get those chord changes to come out in your solos. And I do believe this stuff is really helpful to work on in addition to learning language by ear because then you can start learning that language by ear and then going, oh, I see what Sonny Rollins is doing he targeted the third of the five chord and then he landed on the third of the one chord. Oh, I, that makes sense. Or, oh, he went for this altered approach over top of the five chord resolving to the one, right? You can start hearing this stuff. And all of this lingo I'm saying, where did I get it from? The one chord, the alterations. Well, it's all the stuff we just talked about. The scales, the chords, the scales and the chords, the chord progressions, the jazz standards, and then conceptualizing the jazz language. All right, you see where I'm coming from here? All right, so that was checklist item number six, conceptualizing jazz language. And there's a million different ways to do that. Yes, there's some chord scale theory. You could kind of apply that to conceptualization. But um, yeah, there's different techniques like enclosure, like guide tones, like target tones, um, avoid notes. Uh, we can go on and on different ways to approach understanding jazz language from a music theory perspective. All right. So that is what I would consider my music theory checklist for understanding jazz harmony. This is the music theory side of thinking about jazz harmony and trying to fill in any of those gaps that you may have. So I hope that you are listening and taking notes through this, trying to pay attention to what areas you would consider gray for you. And part of this is just knowing, you know, I mean, everything I mentioned is Oh man, it's like a lifetime of study to just understand this stuff, right? I mean, it's not something that you just really check off your list and you're completely done with it forever, right? It's more like, oh, I have an understanding of this, a basic understanding of this. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to continue, continually go back to some of these fundamentals and be like, hey, I need to understand this better or there's more work I can do on this. I mean, I'm even looking at these things and of course thinking to myself, hey, I could use a little more work on this or I could use a little more work on that or I could know more about this or that, right? We're all students of music and there's always something we can learn more even when it comes to the basics, right? So one more time just to sum up the checklist today. Number one was scales, knowing the basics, knowing the modes and being able to apply patterns to them. Number two was chords, knowing triads, knowing their inversions, knowing seventh chords, knowing their inversions, and knowing basic altered extensions and alterations on uh, seventh chords. Number three was scales and their relationship to the chords. That's chord scale theory, what scales you can apply to different kinds of chords. The number four was chord progressions, know how to build them with major and minor tonalities. 
um, important jazz chord progressions like a two five one, and then common substitutions like a tritone substitution. Number five was jazz standards. Know what tunes and know what important jazz song forms there are that exist and different ways you can approach those. Number six was finally just conceptualizing jazz language, figuring out different techniques or ways to think about how jazz musicians actually solo over top of chord progressions, right? Does that make sense? That's my music theory checklist. Hope that was helpful for you today. Hope that may, gave you something to think about, something to work on. And maybe if my challenge for you this week would be anything, it would be to write down just one of those things that I mentioned that you feel like is a weak spot for you. I want you to write it down and write down exactly what you want to focus on working on this week in the practice room to try to address a fraction of that problem, that gray area that you have in your jazz playing. All right. Hey, thanks for listening to today's show. Hope you found this valuable today. Got a little help from it. I do appreciate you for listening, for checking this out. And like I said at the beginning, hey, if Zero to Improv is something that you think might help you, then go to zerotoimprov.com, buy that book. And of course, the companion course is new for this a great extra resource to help you get through it. There's a community inside there. There is other students working on it with you, posting their assignments. There's video lectures, a lot of other good stuff um, just to help you work through that book. So that's zero to improv.com. If you think this helps you, if you don't think it's going to help you, um, then of course, never buy any of my stuff that I'm saying if it's not going to be helpful for you. But if you do think it is, um, this could be great for you. All right. Um, hey, um, I just want to say, I know we haven't had guests on for a while and don't think that I have forgotten about this. I really wanted to start the year off um, with a lot of you know, these solo episodes and we're going to work our way into some great guests. So, you know, stay tuned for that. There are guests coming up. I haven't forgotten about them. Um, they are going to be on the show. We have a lot of great ones planned for this year. So stay tuned for that. Hey, as I always say, you got some value of today's podcast episode, leave a kind rating and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast episodes. And I want to just, uh, read one off that uh, came in, uh, recently by Chuck DBN says, Brent consistently delivers podcasts that are relevant to me and I suspect to many others with similar backgrounds and competencies. Always well done with content that can help aspiring jazz musicians at almost any level and or instrument. Thanks, Brent, for your hard work. Well, Chuck, if that's your name, thank you so much for the rating review. You listening makes all the hard work worth it. Thanks for that five-star rating review on iTunes. So if you want to uh, leave a five-star rating as well, go ahead to iTunes, quickly do that. Just doesn't take uh, doesn't take more than 30 seconds, really. So thanks in advance for helping me out there. All right, we're going to be coming out with another episode of the podcast, as always, next week. I'll see you back then. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes. And don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.